Good evening, everybody. Um, we're still expecting a few more people, but I understand there's um, train problems at the moment, plus the traffic was very busy tonight as well. Anyway, we'll get going. On behalf of staff and the board of the PMI Victorian History Library, um, I welcome you all to our event today. And my name is Judith Ellis. For people I've not met before, I'm president of the library and chair of the board. And a warm welcome too to our guest tonight, Jessica Curtin, who's going to talk to us about stories, stories stitched in fabric. Not that easy to say, is it? <laughs> Am I echoing, or is that yeah, all right? It is a little bit. Maybe it's a bit loud or something. No, it's oh, I can stand back. I'll drag this further forward. And that okay, so. that's better. Yep, thank you. Um, so, on behalf of us all here, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're getting together tonight. Our library is on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. Sovereignty has never been ceded, it always was, and always will be Aboriginal land. Facilities here for people that perhaps haven't visited before. Um, the bathroom is back through the door of this room, then do a sharp turn, and they're just on the other side of that wall. And we have two um, emergency exits. One is through that door and up the corridor, and the other one is back out where you came in. And if anything does happen, uh, the staff will make sure everybody gets out of the building safely. Our library is the second oldest library in Victoria founded in 1854, and we collect all aspects of Victorian history, as well as interstate or national material, which includes or informs the history of Victoria. And we've got more than 40,000, 40,000 I think now, items on site, all here, and most of that is available for loan. And we're the only for loan collection of this type um, in Australia. Um, our core collection is local history, and we've got information on most towns in Victoria as well. As you can see, Ellen is um, taking photographs and videoing this event, which we use for our promotion and social media, and is available um, through our website on YouTube afterwards for people perhaps that can't come or if you want to watch it again. But if you don't want to be filmed um, or photographed for any reason, make sure you let us know when we can accommodate that. And there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end too, over another cup of tea. So I'd now like to introduce and welcome Jessica, Jessica Curtin, who is the current Vice President of the Brighton Historical Society. Now I did Google you, Jessica, so I understand you um, have been a volunteer with the Society for some years, and also that you manage the Society's large costume collection, which apparently is of state significance, so maybe, maybe you can tell us something about that. Um, and Jessica also contributes to other programs, research and writing for the Society. So you're obviously very engaged and very dedicated, and I'm sure they appreciate it enormously. So Jessica loves um, exploring social histories through collections, just like some of these lovely pieces that we've got here. Um, she'll be highlighting some feature, feature items that have been made by many hands or passed between many people. They are items infused with stories of particular times and places of communities and individuals. And this is clothing that represents human connections across oceans and also over time, over many decades. So please join me in welcoming Jessica to talk to us about stories stitched in fabric. Thank you very much, Judith, and thanks everyone for coming tonight. Uh, so tonight I am going to be talking about the Historical Society's costume collection, uh, a bit about how it's evolved and some of the stories behind the collection. I'll then be focusing in on a few items that embody some very special connections between the people who made them and who used them. But I want to start just with a brief background on our society. So the Brighton Historical Society was founded in 1963. We're actually just coming up on our 60th birthday in October, which we're very excited about. And for the last 20 odd years, we've been based here in the Old Brighton Town Hall. Our mission is to preserve and promote Brighton's history, sharing local stories and helping people to connect to the past. 
We do this in a lot of different ways. We hold events and walking tours. We run programs for local primary schools. We publish a quarterly journal and we answer historical queries ranging from the big to the small, from media queries to in-depth house histories to those niggling everyday questions that come over people. And we also have a very large and diverse collection. Uh, I've, I've got just a few little examples here. Documents and ephemera. We've got a record of wandering cattle from 1920s, which I love. Uh, we have maps and plans, photos and artwork. This is a photo from Hazelaw School, one of the earliest schools in Brighton at Brighton Beach. Uh, artifacts, there's a peg sculptor there made by James Boxall, who was one of the earliest European settlers at Brighton. And it was made in around 1842, very soon after he arrived. And down in the corner there are Chinese lacquer box and documents that belong to a Chinese fruiter, a Si Lu Yi. And of course, we have a large collection of historical clothing. Um, and so the society's been collecting clothing and textiles for over 50 years, beginning in 1971. And this all started with a chance conversation. Rosalind Landells, who was the society's sec secretary, was conducting a walking tour. And she happened to get talking to a lady there whose father had been a local real estate agent. And she said to him, oh, well, you know, my father, he was the one who sold the walk coals home and contents after, after the daughters died. And actually, we've still got some of their stuff. We've still got some clothing. It's been in a box for about 40 years. We didn't touch it except for during the war when there was rationing. And Rosalind's eyes, I can imagine, lit up at this because the Ward Coles were a big name in early Brighton. George Ward Cole was one of Brighton's most prominent early settlers. He was a wealthy merchant, a former Royal Naval officer, and a member of Victoria's upper house. And his home here, St Ninian's, was built around 1841 on a 25-acre beachside property. I like to think of it as the original Golden Mile House. And it was a real, um, a real destination. It was a, uh, parties and receptions were a real who's who of Melbourne society, lots of prominent identities. The most prominent of which was uh, Prince Alfred, uh, Queen Victoria's son in 1867, where he attended a reception in his honour much less dramatic than the reception in Sydney where he got shot. Uh, there was a bit of drama though, because uh, there's a certain dress code that you need to observe when you're meeting royalty, and you would look like an absolute peasant if you weren't observing it. And on this occasion, the men only had one black formal coat between them. So they engineered a solution. They had the prince in one room, they had the ante room outside it. Formal coat there, man would pop on the coat, walk into the room, greet his highness, walk back out and hand it off to the next person. And that way they, they avoided embarrassing their entire colony. <laughs> so Rosalind, hearing about this collection of clothing from the Ward Coles, pounced on it. And this became the basis for the society's costume collection. And the collection includes clothing that belonged to George Ward Cole, like the cape there in the middle, as well as his wife, Thomas Ann, and their daughters. Uh, it includes an evening gown, day dresses, a dressing gown, and a nightgown, showing a real snapshot of the life of the wealthy in early Brighton. So Rosalind was responsible for the costume collection from the 1970s up through the 90s, and she devoted a lot of energy towards growing it and promoting it. And while she was keen to collect clothing of historical significance to Brighton, especially if it was connected to a very prestigious family, a big motivation was acquiring clothing that could be worn by models for costume parades, which she organised with military precision. <laughs> Um, and this was seen as a means of raising money and building the society's profile. And in fact, this is why our collection even today is called a costume collection. It's something that gets us a little bit of confusion every now and then. People think it might be a theatrical costume collection. No, it is um, historical clothing, but it was worn as costume back in the day. And so it does still have that name. And what this meant for collecting was that the society was especially focused on acquiring very elegant clothing, 19th, early 20th century evening wear, wedding dresses, Clothing that looked good on models, looked very eye-catching and elegant. Uh, calls for clothing donations in the old newsletters often included caveats like, please no more black, we've got too much black, we want colours. So a Brighton connection was valuable, but it wasn't seen as essential at the time. And this also affected the way that clothing was handled and stored, because Rosalind saw absolutely nothing wrong with modifying tiny waisted dresses so they could be worn by models. Or for example, and this tore at my heart when I saw it, uh, restoring a child's crinoline skirt because it had been lengthened to account for a growth spurt. So this beautiful story of the growth spurt in the fabric of the dress, completely gone because she wanted to restore it to its original state. 
And these are the kind of things that would make anyone working in collections today recoil. But from Rosalind's perspective, she was working to preserve the history of these dresses because she was trying to share them with audiences, recognising that they were falling apart or would eventually fall apart and wanting to share the stories as widely as she could. So I've got a few examples of some clothing from Rosalind's era. The first one here on the left is an evening dress from around 1840, which belonged to Margaret Law. Margaret came to Australia as a teenager in 1852 um, on a very ill-fated voyage, the Ticonderoga. This was uh, infamous because about 100 passengers died of typhus during the crossing, and that included two of Margaret's siblings. Fortunately, Margaret survived, and her son, Lynn Law, was one of the founders of the Palaco Shirt Company. This dress was passed down through the family for generations. We actually have a wonderful photo of her great-granddaughter wearing the dress and a pair of shoes that were also donated to us. And we're very lucky to have it with us. Um, the one in the middle here is an evening dress from 1909. This belonged to Clara Miller. So Clara, a little similar to the story of the Ward Coles, they were um, a very wealthy, prestigious family who had some uh, friends in high places. They were very close friends with the first governor general, Lord Hopetown. Uh, her husband Septimus was a wealthy businessman and racing identity in Caulfield and they had lavish receptions in their homes. Clara was known for being a glamorous hostess who had lush imported gowns like this one and you can, you can see it, it was the height of fashion at the time. Sadly, Clara and her daughter both died very young. Uh, her daughter was only 13, I think. She died of type 1 diabetes and Septimus, in his grief, sent most of the clothing to her mother, which um, was then passed down to the nieces and made its way to us. The one on the right here, this is one of my favourite wedding dresses in our collection, and we have a few. Um, this wedding dress, it's now cream. It was actually originally an ice blue colour. Uh, it was worn by Betty Nutchie, a local lady, in 1938, and she actually got married in the same Brighton church as her great-grandmother Emily, whose wedding dress we also have in our collection. The wedding was blue and pink themed, so the dress was ice blue, she had a blue veil, and the beading on the dress that was incorporated by the dressmaker was made by her sister Margaret. So that was Rosalind's era, and from about 99, our former president, Di Reedy, took over managing the collection, and she brought with her a, a very different approach. Di was a passionate vintage clothing collector who was interested in the human stories behind clothing. She uh, you know, she loved fashion, she loved the glamour, she loved the beauty, but she really liked the stories of people and what people's clothing had said about them. So she did a great deal of work with other volunteers to modernise our approach to collecting. She sought out clothes from people in the community that had stories to tell about many different facets of Brighton history, not just the wealthy and the prominent, but also working people, migrants, people from all kinds of backgrounds. So I've got a few examples here. The first one is a knitted vest from 1932. This was made by a local lady during the Depression, knitting with a pair of bicycle spokes. Mm -hmm. And it was a gift for her son, and it was much loved, passed through the family, and through a whole succession of nephews. It was a talking point at the office, apparently, for the, the last owner, before he gave it to us. Uh, we've then got a grocer, grocery warehouseman's dust coat from the late 40s, early 50s, a very typical of what would have been worn at grocery stores around Brighton, as this one was, and around Melbourne at the time. And it's a wonderful example of the make, do and mend culture too because you can't really see in that image but there's a lot of mending, lots of darning, lots of repair work that's been done on this. It's a, it's a very well-worn coat. This bathing suit here, this, this is a nice one because it's a wonderful story on its own. I mean, the beach holds such a strong significance for Brighton. It's shaped the way that people in Brighton live and it's somewhere that anyone growing up in Brighton has memories of the beach. And this was worn at Brighton Beach by a, a young woman in the 50s, but it was also designed by a woman from Brighton. Uh, this is an Ada of California swimsuit. And Ada of California was founded by husband and wife, Tony and Ada Murkies. The, the, these two came to Australia as refugees after the Second World War. They were served in the Polish army together, which is where they met, and they arrived with nothing. Um, so, so together they essentially worked from, from the ground up, they built this business, Ada designing the swimsuits, Tony running the business. They ended up buying a property, building a house in Brighton where their daughters still live today. And we um, were lucky a few years ago we were able to get in touch with Ada's daughters and Ada herself and we brought them in to 
so that she could take a look at and tell us about the swimsuits that she designed. And it was really wonderful just talking to her and seeing her interact with the swimsuits like this one, telling us the thought processes that had gone into designing them, little details. This one has a, a little lacy bra inside. She said, yes, I insisted it had to be lacy. Women needed to ha have a sense of luxury. The last one, this is another favourite of mine because even though it's arguably not the most attractive dress, it has an explosive story. This one was worn uh, to the 1977 Brighton Mayoral Ball by Brighton's first female mayor, Di Lopez. Di was, as you might guess from this dress, known for being a very flamboyant figure. She was someone who came into the council ready and looking to shake things up. So the mayoral ball at this time, very staid formal function, not, not a place where you typically shake things up, lots of formal evening wear. Di said, no, it's going to be a night on the town disco theme. <laughs> and the dress code is black tie or jeans, wear whatever you feel comfortable in. This is what Di felt comfortable in because she wanted to make a statement that she wasn't going to be held back by tradition. She was bringing Brighton, kicking and screaming into the present day. <laughs> so another change with our collection over time is that we treat it not as costume but as a museum collection. We recognise we have a responsibility to preserve these pieces of history. And over the last couple of decades, we've been working continually to improve our collection storage with things like padded hangers, archival tissue and boxes. There's certainly no wearing them anymore. We're not doing any Kim Kardashians with Marilyn Monroe's dress. And we also work to preserve the collection in other ways with cataloguing. You can see here, these are just a few of the records that are available online on Victorian collections. Putting our collection online has been really valuable to us, not only because it lets us share our collection more widely, we have limited space and resources in our room, so we can't have a lot of clothing on display at any one time, and there's some things that are simply too fragile to be displaying for any long period. But on Victorian collections, we're able to display a lot of our clothing and to share it very widely. And What's wonderful too is what we get back because we will regularly get people contacting us, telling us more, telling us things that we don't necessarily know about what we have. One of my favourite ones here, um, right on the left there, there's a, it's actually a swimsuit ensemble. You can't see the bathing suit underneath, but it's a, a robe with a plunging back and a one-piece swimsuit white made by Water Sun. So the story behind this, a lady got in touch with me on Instagram. She'd seen that we had some swimwear and she said, oh, my, my mother worked for Water Sun. She was a designer there in the 70s. Do you have any swimsuits from Water Sun? As it happens, we have a lot. And so I was able to send it to Victorian collections. She got back to me immediately. She said, I showed my mum this one. She recognised it straight away. She remembered putting on the, the silver the trim. It was designed for the opening of the Sydney Opera House in 1973. And that these are the kind of things that we wouldn't know without putting our collection online. So the collection today comprises more than 2,000 items, which includes pretty much any type of clothing you can imagine. Evening gowns, dresses, hats, gloves, shawls, nightgowns, underwear, menswear, children's wear, fans, shoes, swimwear, handbags, and some other, as you'll see tonight, very unique pieces. It's been assessed as being of state significance. And today we do have a, a, a much more narrow collection policy. We want to collect clothing and textiles that have a story to tell about Brighton, about the people who've lived in our area, the kind of lives they've led, and how life in Brighton's changed over the decades and been shaped by different groups, organisations and movements. So I've been responsible for the costume collection for about five years now and I don't have a background in fashion history. It's something that I've had to pick up as I've gone along. But something that immediately captured me about this collection was the way that so many of these garments serve as documents of a time and a place and the hands they pass through with stories and emotions sometimes stitched into their very fabric. So I want to share a few of these stories tonight. Items that were made by many hands, shared between loved ones, collaborations among family and friends and even across generations. And we're going to start with the Hodgins family dressing gown. So this was originally a patchwork quilt and it wasn't made in Brighton. In fact, it found its way to Brighton almost by accident. This was another Rosalind story. Rosalind loved to troll the op shops because this was a period where there were still a lot of Victorian garments in op shops but for sale. So she would be trawling the op shops looking for clothing to be worn in the costume parades. And in the process in Sandringham, she found this dressing gown and was dumbstruck. She was thinking, where has this come from? What is it? She was 
looking at the patchwork and seeing there's inscriptions on there from the 1890s. And so she got in touch with someone she knew at Women's Day and she got, had an article run on it and the lady who donated it read the article and got in touch with the society and gave us its story, which begins in 1861 when William Hodgins, an Irish migrant and merchant, married Polly Aimer in Dalesford. So Dalesford at this time, it was a fast growing town. It had only been established nine years earlier, about after the discovery of gold. And by 1859, it had already been declared a borough with around 3,400 gold seekers. We don't know if it was the lure of gold that brought him here or just the lure of all the gold seekers and their money, uh, but they did settle in Dalesford where they had their first five children. The quilt was probably started after they left Dalesford. It was made by the children, but we do have one possible memory of life on the diggings here. This is a little patch on, on the dressing gown that seems to resemble Lola Montez. Lola was a very well-known 19th century celebrity, very notorious Irish woman who herself as a Spanish dancer, had very public affairs all across Europe. And she did two of the Victorian goldfields in the 1850s. She caused lots of public outcry with a risque dance and was a real hit with the diggers. So possible, possible shout out, shout, throwback to their life in the goldfields there. But around 1875, the gold rush was in the decline and the Hodgins family moved to Emerald Hill, which is now South Melbourne. And they established the Adelphi Family Hotel in Ferris Street, just south of the junction of St Kilda and the Port Melbourne train lines. There's, you can see a little star there. Just about here. And by this time they had nine children because it was the 19th, 19th century. <laughs> um, and Emerald Hill was a very rapidly growing settlement at the time. Factories, foundries, shops, lots of industries connected with shipping because it was right near Port Melbourne. Parts of the area were favoured by the wealthy but it was mostly a working class area with modest single storey terraces and cottages. And you can possibly see in this um, patch here um, what might be an illustration of a, a little house, a little cottage with garden. The reason it was called Emerald Hill, the hill on which the town hall stands was a volcanic outcrop in the middle of a swampy flood prone mudflat covered in greenery and wildlife and the name is attributed to a Port Phillip Herald journalist who in 1845 described it as green as the freshest shamrock encircled by shining lagoons, the sparkling sea and the growth of scrub and tea tree. And you can see here the patchwork did include a lot of uh, wildlife, a lot of domestic animals, a lot of plants and flowers, all the kinds of things that the girls would likely have seen in their environment. And being close to the ports, ships would have also been a regular sight and would have been a regular sight for the girls because William had a victualler's licence allowing him to supply food to the ships. So it was around this time in Emerald Hill that the girls had begun working on the quilt and it grew into a shared project. Whenever their friends visited, whenever family visited, they'd be given a scrap of silk or velvet and invited to embroider a message or write a message in ink. We've got a, a couple of inscriptions there dated to 1894, memory of a charming friend and I think that one's Little Stuart, little drawings of people and animals, all these little memories around, around their environment. It was also a creative outlet for the girls themselves. Uh, not only stitching, but applique, illustration, embroidery, and even painted portraits. Uh, these ones were made by one of the daughters, Ada Hodgins, who used fa fabric scraps for grounds, gowns and bonnets and embroidered little details and even included real human hair. And we see family milestones being celebrated. The two of the Hodgins brothers, uh, in the 1890s started a brewery, Warnable Brewery, and one of the products they sold was Bravo Ale, which is memorialised in two little patches here on the patchwork. A couple of other little details. There are a lot of flags on the, um, on the, uh, the dressing gown. As you can imagine, they would have seen a lot of flags at the ports. One of them in particular is this backwards American flag, which seems to resemble the program for the visit of the Great White Fleet. This was a big event. It was a visit from the US Navy. Uh, 14 battleships that, uh, sorry, battleships, US battleships that sent 14 months circumnavigating the globe. It was sort of billed as a, a courtesy visit, um, show of goodwill and display of their power. A bit sort of trying to discourage the tensions with Japan, trying to deter war. We also have what appears to be a comet 
resembling Halley's Comet. This was another major event in 1910 because it was the first time the comet was ever photographed. And widely anticipated, thanks to very extensive press coverage, which ranged from the scientific to the wildly alarmist. When it was learned that Earth would actually pass through the comet's tail, there were fringe claims that gases in the comet would poison the atmosphere, leading to an upsurge in gas mask purchases before the comet's passage. So the Hodgins family continued to run the hotel till about 1913, and after that it was sold to the railway company for future rail development. The quilt itself was never finished, and eventually it went to Ada, who passed it down to her daughter Valenti, who made it into this dressing gown. Valenti was uh, growing older in her 70s when she moved to Sandringham, and having nobody to pass it on to, she decided to donate it to a local op shop, which is where it was found by Rosalind. But it's such a beautiful piece. It's like, it's like a three-dimensional scrapbook or a little time capsule. It's a rich document that tells this story, not only of the sisters who made it and their creativity, but also their family connections, their friendship, and the community that they lived in, this lovely little slice of life from early Melbourne. So from something that was made by multiple women, something worn by multiple women, this is a wedding dress that was worn by three brides between 1941 and 1948, which, of course, Second World War, time of conflict and austerity. The Australian government had introduced clothing rationing in June 1942 to ensure there were enough key commodities for military needs. And rather like we saw in 2020 with the toilet paper, had people swarming to stores intent on stockpiling, but even to stockpile, you, you have to have the resources to do that, and lots of people didn't at the time. And stockpiles, of course, could only last for so long. As well as rationing, the National Council of Clothing Styling it was established to regulate the design of clothing items to minimise fabric usage. This would include things like a maximum length allowed for skirts, bands on voluminous sleeves, bands on any accessories except belts, and belts had to be limited to five centimetres wide or less. Restrictions on buttons, cuffs and tails, very austere. Um, ration coupons were issued to each individual annually with 112 clothing coupons in two six-month allotments and they had to cover absolutely everything. Once you were finished, that was it. You would have to make, do, amend, loan, swap or find something that fell off the back of the truck, I suppose. <laughs> but even with the world at war, births and deaths and marriages were continuing. In fact, there was an upsurge in marriages because a lot of couples were rushing to tie the knot because the grooms were often leaving for military service. It was possible to buy a wedding dress and clothing coupons, of course the Queen did that, but it was much easier if you had plenty of resources to begin with and you weren't relying on your coupons for all your everyday clothing needs. So a lot of brides would instead borrow their dress and we have a few dresses in our collection that, um, that we use exactly this way. These two dresses were both made before the war. You can see from the design, they're very voluminous, um, quite uh, luxurious fabrics, silks, lace, um, very long train. Uh, and so both of them were made before the war, um, for weddings before the war, and then reused by brides after. Uh, the first one was originally worn by Floss McMinn for her wedding in Brighton in 1940. Uh, Floss and her sister Vera were daughters of Horace McBinn, who owned the Fruit Palace in Church Street, and her sister Vera subsequently wore the same dress for her wedding a couple of years later. The second dress, I do love this story. Um, this was originally worn in 1941 by Ella Sutcliffe, and her husband Eric had enlisted in the army, and he'd been called to duty. So the, they had a deadline, they needed to get married. But she was in Adelaide, he was in Nil, and he had to get there first. As it happened, he was travelling by train the night before the wedding and there was water on the track and he was delayed. So he was supposed to arrive at nine in the morning. He didn't get there till seven in the evening, three hours after the wedding was supposed to start. Ella kept running out to the public phone trying to figure out what was going on. The minister's twiddling his thumbs and being offered endless cups of tea by the, her mother. Uh, they had to send the taxis and photo photographer away and then call them back because he suddenly arrived. And after all that, the banks were closed, he couldn't withdraw money to pay them, so they had to pass around a hat to pay them, <laughs> to pay everybody. So after that very dramatic wedding, um, the dress had a second life in 1943 when it was worn by Ella's sister Eileen, and it was precisely for the, the reason of rationing. She didn't have enough coupons for her own dress. 
And this dress here was worn at three weddings in the same family and at the same church, St James in Garden Vale. Our first bride was Bid West, who married in 1941. And this was still pre-rationing, but you can see the impact of austerity on the dress. It's quite understated. It's a synthetic crepe, no train, modest sleeves and quite simple beading. In the photo there, you can see Bid with her 12-year-old niece, Jocelyn, who was one of the bridesmaids. Uh, the next bride was a different Jocelyn, Jocelyn Harvey, who married Bid's brother Carl in 1944, turned to marry. The war was over by this point and not sure if rationing had either just ended or was about to end. Possibly it was just sentimental reasons that she was wearing this dress, but it became this source of connection and a shared memory between these three brides. So next we've got a collection of clothing that was passed down through one family. Ah, we've got a few people who know Olga. So this is Olga Black's family. Um, she has lived in Brighton for many years, but her family originally came from Greece. Her parents, Constantine and Tula, were both born on the island of Ithaca, but Tula's family migrated to Romania around 1892 when she was only six months old. So she spent most of her childhood in a Romanian village. And there she learned to sew from her mother and she developed her skills in embroidery and lace making, creating items for her wedding trousseau. Some of the clothing that she created was made from linen woven by her own grandmother, Olga's great-grandmother on Ithaca. So we've got a few images here. This is Olga's grandmother, uh, Tula's mother, Vasiliki, who was, uh, and on the left here, we've got a nightshirt that she embroidered for her husband. And, and I love this because it's something that would only be seen by essentially her and her husband, but you can see the hours of work and detail that's got into it, just embroidering this, this nightshirt that would, nobody would even see. Next, we've got a nightgown that was made by Vasiliki for Tula's trousseau. Again, just such a wonderful amount of detail with the cutwork embroidery, the lace, a, a real expression of her love for her daughter and her desire to see her daughter well situated. And this one is made by Tula herself as a teenager in Romania, um, using lace inserts, showing the skills that she had gained from her mother. So on the other side of the family, uh, in 1892, Constantine's oldest brother had emigrated to Melbourne. Uh, like a lot of migrants, he started his new life with a new name. So Dionysius Mavrikevlos became Dennis Black. And in 1902, Constantine, 18 years old, came out to Melbourne to work for Dennis, who'd established himself in the cafe industry. But a few years later, in uh, 1912, he returned to Greece to fight in the Balkan War. And it just so happened that Tula was visiting Ithaca at the same time that Constantine returned to the island. The two of them clearly hit it off because within three weeks they were married. And in 1914, they were travelled to Melbourne together. So since his account and qualifications weren't recognised in Australia, he kept working in his brother's cafes. In 1917, he and Tula opened the Paris Residential Cafe in Swanston Street. This was quite an upmarket establishment, uh, offered accommodation, private dining, 50 rooms with modern fittings, hot water in the bathrooms and electric lifts, restaurant with live musicians specialising in theatre suppers. And they saw some years of success, but like a lot of families, the depression hit them hard and it forced them to close. So during the Depression, Tullis began taking work for a factory in Flinders Lane, embroidering um, cuffs, collars, sleeves and blouse fronts. You can see an example here of one of the blouses she embroidered, and it's also over on the table there. Um, Olga was born around this era, Melbourne in 1930, and she spent her preschool days sitting at the table with her, where her mother worked. Tula would involve her by letting her help choose the colour combinations. <laughs> Olga told us that one of her first memories of Brighton is as a six-year-old, there she is, six years old, um, when her mum in hat, veil, gloves, stockings and dress would take the five kids on the tram from their home in Brunswick to Brighton Beach, uh, where eventually they would buy a unit themselves in the 1960s. And just as Tula learned to sew from her mother, Olga learned from Tula. She reinvented some of Tula's trousseau night dresses and skillfully altered other clothing, making dresses which she wore around Brighton for many years. We've got here a skirt that was uh, embroidered by Olga in the 1950s, but it's actually made from linen woven by her great-grandmother. This one here um, is an apron that was made, again, from linen woven by her great-grandmother, 
but Tula actually made this apron. She was a teenager in Romania. She added the embroidered monogram and the lace trim, which was the very first piece of lace that she made on her own. And Olga in the 1950s added her own mark on it with the colourful embroidered flowers. And I just, I love this piece, it's this expression of family connection. Olga using these skills that had passed on from her mother, who'd learned from her mother, adding her own mark to this clothing that was made by their hands. And this was a real way that she could connect to her Greek heritage as well and the homeland of her parents. And this sense of connection is something that she had, has always found important, she said. Uh, she found a connection to her heritage in Greek dancing, which she practised from childhood, and she eventually became a teacher and started her own Greek dancing school, wanting to pass on that cultural connection to the next generation of Greek Australians. So when she had the opportunity to represent her culture, in 1956, she took it eagerly. This was, I'll jump ahead, November 29 at the MCG, there were nearly 400 migrants of different nationalities attending in their national costume. They'd been provided tickets by the Commonwealth Oil Refineries Limited, which was BP's marketing association in Australia, as a gesture for appreciation for the contribution of migrants. So Olga was there excitedly wearing her Greek national costume. And it's that connection to family and heritage that makes this connection, collection really special. It's this beautiful story of Australian migrant heritage, this family that's had to reinvent itself and adapt to a new home on the other side of the world while treasuring their roots and holding them close. But it's also a really universal story about mothers and daughters, a skill and a love that connects them across four generations. So finally, this is a delightfully eccentric piece. It was created by a group of Brighton women between 1990 and 2008. And I, I love it as a little bookend to the, the dressing gown because it is uh, a, a little bit of a similar concept. It's uh, these ladies exploring their creativity and making something together. But their story begins with a group of ladies who'd been working for the Brighton Council, mostly social services late department and administrative staff. One of the ladies had been leaving the, uh, her position, but she didn't want to lose contact with the friends she'd made. So the lovely, luscious, learned ladies of Brighton was formed. <laughs> so this particular lady described herself as a would-be but poor knitter who would needed a colleague's help to untangle a knitting project in the past. And with this in mind, she suggested, why don't we do a shared knitting project? She knitted 10 rows and declared that every member of the group would do the same in turn. And from there, they came up with a set of rules. Number one, whoever had the piece had to knit 10 rows before the next meeting. Number two, the yarn could not be bought for the project, but could be, quote, begged, borrowed or stolen. Three, the colour was at the discretion of the knitter, but judgment will be passed by others. Four, no tampering with the work of others. Five, on returning the work, the knitter would declare the final purpose as a piece of the piece for a guide for future knitters. Six, the next knitter could and was encouraged to change that state of purpose and may this piece serve to bind us together. They would meet bi-monthly in local restaurants and hotels to catch up, gossip and pass over the knitting to the next person. And over 18 years, it grew to represent the group's friendship, their shared memories and their personal passions. We've got a couple of examples here. But being council staff, they couldn't just have informal catch-ups. They needed meetings with typed agendas and minutes all preserved in a big binder. <laughs> However, being the kind of people they were, it also wasn't a typical agenda. They would take attendance, they would take apologies, then the rest of the meeting would be knitting updates, gossip, extensively recorded in the minutes, and games or quizzes. They never took anything too seriously. So I've got a few examples from the minutes here. This is from February 1997. Robert's young girl at work is uppity. She's probably downity by now unless morale has improved. <laughs> Heather's too hot to get dressed to up to go to the interviews. She hopes that a job she enjoys will just turn up. Jan is just going to tell lies regarding her job search. She's really too old. And does she really want to work? <laughs> <laughs> Jan has been back on Rye, Be Rye Beach with who? Heard it was very romantic. Certainly put stars in her eyes. They'll drink out Jan's wine, but we're not telling her. <laughs> Heather had a call from Lewis who asked her out. Heather brushed him off. She felt a four times married man would be unreliable. <laughs> and that they are, it is a huge binder and it is just full of this gossip. It's all their in jokes, all their, all their just needling at each other. It's wonderful. The knitting went missing around 94, which prompted some very melodramatic odes to its demise before it was discovered again in a council office in 1996. They'd started another knitting project in the interim, so they ended up joining the two of them together. 
And we can see their sporting passions here. We've got North Melbourne's 99 Grand Final win, Sydney 2000 Olympics, the 2001 Grand Prix, Little Sharon. Uh, lots of holidays and milestones. The Queen's Golden Jubilee in 2002. We've got Christmas, St Patrick's Day. Uh, we've got some special variegated wool for autumn. Uh, and some melted tinsel from when a member left the knitting in a hot car. <laughs> Which was soundly roasted by everybody, I gather. And lots of different badges and ornaments. There's baby booties for the birth of a grandchild. There's a wedding commemoration. Lots of little sheep because the sheep became their mascot over the years. And over time they used to joke about the knitting ending up one day in a museum which isn't too far from what happened in the end and really it's a, they, they may have joked about it but it is a very worthwhile piece for our collection. As I said it, it is like a modern version of our dressing gown, it's this document of a friendship that tells us so much about the women when they made it, their lives in Brighton, their passion and their shared sense of humour. So, any questions? Um, do you have, is there, is, so I can see parts of the collection at the town hall or is it, or is it, hey, sorry? So we're based at the, the town hall, we're on the second floor above the gallery. We have some, uh, some items on display, we also have um, uh, our collection on Victorian collections um, where there's a, a, about a little over a hundred items on display at the moment. Right. Um, what are you doing going forward, so for collecting modern clothing, because invariably it ends up um, disintegrating, so are you, are you seeing a problem into the future? It, it is definitely a challenge. Um, with our swimwear collection, for example, a lot of synthetics and um, that is a challenge. Realistically, we can only do what we can do within our resources, so we try to keep things in archival boxes in, um, in uh, you know, in temperature controlled conditions as much as we can. Um, More than stuff survives. Right, yeah. Most of the stuff I'm getting rid of clothes that usually they're not suitable for something like this. Yeah, so I, I suppose that's something we haven't run into much yet, but I can see, especially with the way that things are made to be more disposable yeah. now, it does pose an issue for us, but it's not something we run into at the moment. Can I just pick up on that for the next question? If you're collecting things that are more modern or planning to, how do you select that or do you just wait for donations but not get you know, bags of stuff that have gone off to the <laughs> And then how do you curate that? Yeah, so we, we are going mostly on donations um, at present um, and we really are quite selective because we are limited in terms of our space and resources. So, so we collection criteria. Yeah, so our criteria is really um, around its connection to the history of Brighton. What does it tell a story about Brighton, about someone from Brighton, about about our area? Well, Jessica, thanks for a marvellous talk, and uh, I do have a question. But first of all, I'd just like to say uh, Olga is a friend of mine. She's about ninety-two or something, even older. We all went to Greece, and we went to Ithaki, her little village, and uh, she's a, a marvellous folk dancer. She even dance with the Dora Stratu Dance Theatre. If ever, anyone's ever been to Athens, that's the big folkloric place in the centre of Athens that everybody goes to. So we took her there on the weekend of her 90-something birthday. Oh, that's so um, wonderful. So she's fantastic. She just dances still, like, you know, in um, Hugh Oakley, right. yes, um, every Wednesday. Oh, that's so wonderful. Anyway, I guess, like, thank you so much for your talk. I guess my question was, uh, could you expand a bit more about the difference between a costume that was the kind of purview of a previous curator and what you sort of... What, what's this distinction between costume... So when I say costume, I mean something that people would wear as, as a dress-up type thing, so uh, either on stage or in... Uh, in the case of uh, our collection, it was worn in costume parades. So Rosalind would have models, she would um, get them to dress up. They would often modify the dresses because these are dresses that were made to be worn with corsets. So they would have to modify the dresses, take out the seams to accommodate these um, modern waistlines. Yeah. 
Um, These days, you know, you can buy a costume for Halloween yeah. or whatever. But uh, back in my day, if you had a costume dress up day at school, you'd wear something of your mum. Absolutely. Or something like that, and you'd go as a whatever you could think of. Um, I'm still grappling with terminology. <laughs> so for, for us, these are, um, these are items that have uh, historical yeah. significance and we have a responsibility to preserve them and to be able to share their stories with future generations and with people today. So we want to make sure that they are um, preserved as well as possible. Um, you might, have, you might remember when Kim Kardashian wore Marilyn Monroe's dress at the Met Gala, there was a lot of talk at the time about people were quite horrified and there were people saying, oh, why is it such a big deal? And the reason is that wearing a dress like that is going to put strain on the fabric, on the stitching, on the beading, and it will ultimately make it uh, more fragile and more prone to falling apart. So we want to prevent that from happening. So she turned it from a museum piece into a costume just because she's a person with a lot of money and because that item was yeah. available in the marketplace. Yeah, so she wore it as a costume and um, we, a lot of people would argue that it should be a museum piece because it has a, a historical significance and it seems quite, quite selfish and quite self-centred to wear something that has a story that inc incorporates the history of the world to, um, and the history of Hollywood to, to, to just one person's vanity. That one's owned by Ripley's Believe It or Not. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So it, it, because it wasn't in a, a technically a museum, she was able to wear it. Jessica, thinking of costumes, um, obviously the um, Art Centre has got a fabulous collection. Has there been any thought about lending some of the stuff to the Art Centre for an exhibition on the lower lower floor down the stairs where they have those cases with beautiful, beautiful stuff in it because there's still costumes, that early ones, but not necessarily of movie stars or, or you know. So the, the clothing that we have, we do have a couple of um, like clothing that was made to be costumes. Most of them is just historical clothing that was worn as costumes in these parades. So they don't quite um, intersect with um, performing arts. But um, yeah, it, it is definitely something we're always interested in looking at new ways that we can share the collection. And they've got such good stories behind them. Mm, it's lovely for absolutely. other people across Melbourne and elsewhere to... to yeah, see. and we do, we do love to be able to share our collection. We recently loaned a dress to the Bendigo Art Gallery for oh, yes. the Women's Weekly exhibition. Oh, that was brilliant. <laughs> that. It was really good. Um, yeah. Before that, we, we loaned a 19th century dress to Melbourne Museum. So we're, we're constantly, we're, we're very interested in um, those kind of collaborations. So is there another hand up? Yes. No. No? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I just was going to say it's interesting about the terminology because Victorian and Edwardian people would have referred to outfits like that as costumes mm. and they would have called what we call costumes fancy dress, like for a fancy dress ball. Yeah, you're right. And in fact, we do have a fancy dress costume from that era in the collection. And I suppose it's um, when... When I say costume collection today, I've had people say, oh yes, we have a costume collection too, and show me theatrical costume. And, and so there's that just sort of confusion of um, uh, people thinking, oh, you, you've got clothing that was worn in the theatre, which we don't. And they're, they're both types of historical clothing. The historical theatre garments would probably be as, as brutally treated as working. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I've seen images and things, and a lot of them are altered and altered and altered again. And I've actually got a few pieces, mm. they're not that old, they're from probably the 70s to 90s from the College of the Arts. Mm. And the amount of chucks and brutalisation of the inside <laughs> garment to make it fit whoever's wearing it this week. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, just, it just has to look good from the seats. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry, another question. Uh, I'm intrigued by the mayoral ball outfit worn by some carrots. Dye Lopez. Dye Lopez. Um, can you tell, me, tell us a bit more about the mayoral ball? Because I, from my end, well, I don't know what they were like in the 1976 or 77, 
that in previous years, but um, I know a bit about the mayor. Well, I think it was the, where the mayor presented the Debs, debutantes. Is it the same thing in 1976, Jessica? Or? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, and I'm not even sure where the mayor ball stopped. I know there was a, a mayor around the same time as Di, Aubrey Sealway, who very famously said, we're not having a mayoral ball, we're having an Australia Day sausage sizzle and everyone's invited. <laughs> uh, so I, the 70s, I think, were a time for things being shaken up. But I, I know we do have dev dresses from around the 60s and 70s, so it's possible it was still um, being done then. In the 70s, mm. 70s. It may have been that the debutant ball was organised and then the mayor was invited. That's true, yeah. I, my, my debut was just coming back into Vogue in 19... Yes. And um, my mum actually grew up in Brighton. Um, yeah, and we had the mayor of Casey now, Beric, um, who we was presented to her. Um, but that was like she was invited. Um, and what did you call it? A debutante. A debutante. Yeah. So if you still got the address, that might be interesting. Would you have got a writing address? It would have been by someone who grew up in Brighton. <laughs> So, Jessica, how did your collection get this state significance? How was that? So, this was, um, uh, I mentioned our former president, Di Reedy, who was really um, the driving force behind modernising the collection, and Di was also the one who really pushed to get a significance assessment. So, that was in 2010, I believe, and so she worked very hard with the, the other volunteers at the time to catalogue the collection. There really wasn't a lot of documentation at that time, so she worked very hard to pull together doc the documentation. Um, we were able to get a grant for a significance assessment, which led to the collection being assessed as state significance. Oh, okay. And ongoing funding comes from... Uh, well, we're an um, entirely volunteer-run organisation. We um, run from the membership fees, essentially, so, um, yeah. <laughs> OK, I'll close this part of the evening. It was obviously too popular and this gets down the back and can continue chatting. Jess, thank you so much for such a fabulous, colourful presentation. Lots of things to look at. Um, we haven't had much to do with the library before. We have lots of events on. Um, daytime, evening, book clubs, um, book sales, all sorts of things. So um, if you haven't already um, been to any of that, you can 